A reading from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians. Hear now the word of the Lord. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, made, God made the one who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As we work together with him, we entreat you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time I have listened to you. On a day of salvation I have helped you. Look, now is the acceptable time. Look, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way. In great endurance, afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. In purity, knowledge, patience, kindliness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and look, we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing everything. The word of the Lord. The scripture passages today do not let us turn away, and that is why we are here. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of the most important shapers of our modern reform thought, says in his seminal book, The Cost of Discipleship, and please forgive the gendered framing, when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. And I think that in some mysterious way, that is what we are doing here today. As we planned and prayed for this Ash Wednesday, there was a desire to make sure our children would be included but there was also some trepidation about how this might all land for them. But I think they need to know the same thing us grown-ups do. Frankly, I think they are sometimes better at knowing and accepting the things we try so hard to keep at bay. Ash Wednesday is a dark day. We are invited to come and, well, die die to ourselves and ask for the forgiveness from sin that we know we need. There, I said it, sin. Though we like to avoid it and for good reason, this day is about atoning and repenting and reflecting for the ways that we have not lived into our call as disciples. Our readings today, Psalm 51 is revealed to us in our first hymn and Isaiah and Paul in his letter to the Corinthians, do not let us look away from what we have become and how we fail. However, in the Corinthian letter, we are given a clue to a lifeline out. I'll get to that. Because yes, the good news is about life and wholeness, but we get there by going through. We cannot avoid the wilderness. And that's what Lent is. And that's what this day symbolizes the start of this time when we go through the fire where we are cleansed and made new. We know what's coming, but before Holy Week and then Easter in this period of our year, we try to stay blinded to it. We don't get to skip to the exhilarating joy that is at the other end of this path, the joy that we know Mary feels when it is revealed to her on her path who the gardener is. So we wait and pray. Psalm 51 lays it all out repeatedly, giving us the words that we seek. Wash, cleanse, purge, create, restore, sustain, teach, deliver. Moving from degradation to action to rebuilding. We need all of it because we continually turn away from the life of wholeness and goodness that is offered to us. 
Goodness seems so trite sometimes. The idea that if we are good, we will get the things we want, or that by being good, it's a kind of straitjacket that keeps us from the badness. Our problem is not being good or bad, but that we keep wanting the wrong things, each of us in our own way. And we think those things will bring us the joy, wholeness, love, comfort, safety, and possibility we are seeking. And they never do. Never. Oh, we can fool ourselves into thinking they do or will, but they won't. And that is why we are here together. Because of the still small voice that keeps whispering, come to me. Before we get there, we should perhaps stew a bit in the degradation part because, you know, these things that we seek are that are going to fill the hole, to bring us the joy, the fleeting happiness, those are the things that lead us to sin. We are sinners, even the little ones. And it is hard because the world seems designed to assist us in turning away from God. But it is not what we are made for. We are not made depraved and for sinning. Sorry, Calvin. We were made for a shalom from which we too often turn away. Why? I wish I knew. But we do, again and again. Our desires turn us away. The foolishness of our worldly desires is that they don't compare to what we are offered. In God, we are offered an undepletable joy, so full, so rich, that we would need nothing else were we to truly depend on it. We would, in fact, want nothing else. And yet we keep going toward these things that bring us away from the God who waits, because our desires turn us to the things that we think will bring us life, but only bring us a kind of death. Our personal and communal desires for things we don't actually need, but they, we think will complete us. They lead all of us to behaviors and actions that take us even further from the way. And I do mean the way with a capital W, Jesus' way, his truth and life, which can be our life. These things kill us and move us away from the center of all that is needed. But I want us to listen again to, to what Paul says to the Corinthians. First, he uses the ancient rhetorical technique of puffing himself up as a paragon of self-sacrificing Christian love. It is an impossible standard, and we can't but fail. However, he says we are impostors and yet authentic, unknown and yet known, dying and yet alive, punished and yet not killed, sorrowful and yet rejoicing, poor yet rich, having nothing and yet possessing everything. And yet, and yet. That is what I think the ashes you will receive in a few moments represent. The great and yet that Paul sees and promises. Yes, we come tonight in mourning and in sorrow and in desperate need of forgiveness from the ways, small and large, that we have sinned and died. The ways that we have turned away from God who seeks us and loves us. The God who loved us so dearly that he came to us and died on the cross. And yet. Every moment of our lives, we have the and yet before us, this ability to choose the love and goodness we are made for. Isaiah shows us, too, the sublime beauty of what can be if we live and serve in the way to which we are called. He says, we shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. We shall be the repairers of the breaches and restorers of the streets to live in. Our light shall rise in the darkness and our gloom will be like the noonday. Oh, the possibility and beauty of what we can do when we follow the way, when we die to ourselves and live in him. And yet. Ash Wednesday doesn't really have any biblical precedent. There are places where sackcloth and ashes are worn, mostly in the Old Testament, as a way to mourn and repent, but there is no clear liturgical precedent. The imposition of ashes emerged about a thousand years ago. It was taken up by the church. It was abandoned by Presbyterians at some point, but we have come to pick it up again. 
I sense a growing need in our tradition to go deeper into these practices so that we might go deeper into where our lives are supposed to lead. These ashes are a gateway symbol into our own private and communal time to reflect and repent on where we have been, where we have turned away, where we have sinned, and to think about the darker corners of our life, and to think about how to bring light to them. Jesus did the same. He is our model and our way, as he did in those mysterious 40 days in the wilderness where he faced all the temptations we face. And he said no. And then he died because we can't. And by becoming sin who knew no sin, he has made and is making a way for us to be reconciled to God. And so we live in today's darkness knowing that there will always be the and yet. When you come forward today, we place a cross of ashes on your forehead or hand. Know that they also say to you, and yet, that though you have turned away, though you have sinned, though you have dark corners, and yet you are loved, forgiven, cherished, known, needed, despite all those things that are pulling you from the life everlasting. So come, come and die, and yet you will be made new. It is important to remember that what is happening here tonight, uh, you are coming to receive ashes. There is no way around what they represent. Our fallenness, our sin, our brokenness, our finiteness, and yes, our death all the things for which we need saving and forgiveness and grace. But tonight, we get to follow that symbol with communion, that gift Jesus gave to us, that promise that if we can come to his table to eat of his body and blood, that redemption and forgiveness and love would always be on offer. Always. But we must turn to it. Here the journey will be a few short steps. We will bestow ashes and then offer communion. Sometimes that journey will be or is much longer. 40 days or 40 years, I don't know. But it does not need to be any longer than we decide. He is waiting. So come and die and then be made new you are dust, and to dust you shall return, and yet, and yet.